Thanks for joining us for a North Greenville University Chapel service. Thank you for the privilege of being here with you today. North Greenville has a special place in my heart. I was born and raised about six miles from here a number of years ago. I'm going to tell you what that number is. But a good while back, my wife is a graduate here, even though I went to Charleston Southern, forgive me. And uh, a granddaughter is a graduate in here, and she sang in Joyful Sound a few years ago. And uh, then my, one of my sons in the Lord that you've heard preach here, and I want to give you a prayer request for him, uh, Jose Rondon, Captain Jose Rondon, who's a chaplain in the U.S. Army, had the joy of sharing the gospel with him when we were missionaries in Venezuela, seeing him come to Christ and then come on to North Greenville and then to seminary, then become a U.S. citizen, join the U.S. Army. And if you haven't heard, since last March, at the post where he's stationed, the military base, there have been around 10,000 soldiers who have professed faith in Jesus Christ through his leadership as a chaplain there. And And just recently, he has been appointed regimental chaplain at West Point, the military academy. And what a, a, a great opportunity to influence the future officers in the U.S. Army to see many of them come to Christ. Let me tell you something, if you haven't been keeping up with it, there's a spiritual awakening going on in the military. Many, many of the young men and women are coming to Christ. So if you ever run anybody and say, they tell you, well, Christianity is just for the weak and the wimps. <laughs> Don't tell that on the military basis because they're coming to Jesus in large numbers. Well, it is a joy to be here with you today. And today I'm not coming to speak as a professor, although I want to encourage you to pray about when you finish here, if you're going in a graduate program, you take a close look at the Greer campus. In the, in, for example, in Christian ministry, we have the Master of of uh, arts and Christian ministry, the Master of Divinity, Doctor of Ministry. We have great programs in the School of Education, School of Business, School of Music, and also a Physician Assistance Program that's just fantastic. So would you at least say, I'm gonna pray about the graduate school that North Greenville has before you make a decision to go somewhere else. Can you agree to do that? All right, thank you. But again, today I don't come to speak to you as a professor, but I want to share with you from my experiences of over 20 years in international missions. Uh, half of that time in Costa Rica, the majority of the time in Venezuela, and then half of that time over in, uh, in Richmond on staff of the International Mission Board, uh, where I served for three years as Southern Baptist World Hunger Consultant, and six years, or almost seven years, in uh, processing short-term volunteers. Some of you have gone through the International Mission Board as summer missionaries, uh, or short-term trips. Well, that was my office years ago that I gave direction to. And so uh, I, I just come to you today to share with you from the heart of a missionary on the subject of proclaiming the gospel to a perishing world. And this world is a perishing world, but the answer is the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're gonna look at a passage of scripture that begins in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24, and it continues through chapter 7 and verse 9. For sake of time, I'm only going to read verse 9, but then I'll be referring to some of the other verses in that passage beginning with 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 24. But verse 9, it says this, Then they, and the they are four lepers that I'm going to tell you more about in just a little while. Then they said to one another, We are not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we remain silent. Father in heaven, I thank you once again for the privilege of looking into the book that is forged and fashioned by you. Thank you that you tell us this book is the sword of the Spirit. And so, Father, to understand it, we need the illumination from the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the privilege of using this sword in your service. But again, God, the power is not in us, it's found in you. So Holy Spirit of God, fill us, open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts to understand the truth from your word that you have for us today. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. 
Well, I bet you some of you have discovered by experience that it pays, uh, it pays to pay attention in class, amen? If you don't pay attention in class and then you get one of those pop quizzes or, or, or something unexpected comes up, oh, you're in trouble. My wife and I were in Costa Rica in language school and uh, I had a friend there, he's a missionary in Uruguay now, just doing a great job, or he was in Uruguay, but he had trouble with the language. And the problem was he just couldn't hear it well. And you've got to really be able to hear it before you can speak it. So one day he said to me, Bill, will you go with me downtown San Jose uh, on the bus? Well, because when I, I go in, into places where crowds are, like getting on a bus or going to the market, sometimes when I say something, the people uh, laugh at me or, or they look at me strange and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I said, well, I'll go with you and I'll, I'm not sure I can figure it out, but we'll try. Well, it didn't take long. As we started getting on the bus, you know, get on the bus in Central or South America, you just push your way through the crowd. And so we're pushing our way through the crowd, and he's in front of me, and he thought he was saying, disculpe me, por favor, which is excuse me, please. But he made a little bit of a mistake. Instead of disculpe me, he was saying, escupe me, por favor. And those of you who speak Spanish, you know that means spit on me, please. <laughs> And so I took him aside and I said, Ron, listen, brother, you better be glad they didn't answer your prayer. And, and my advice is you go back to phonetics class and you listen a little closer and you get these words down right. Brother, it pays to pay attention in class. And so today I want us to pay attention to what we're being taught in this passage of Scripture. In 2 Kings, the passage we're going to look at, we're taught four facts that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you must jealously guard in your heart and fearlessly proclaim without hesitation. And so let's begin looking at those. The first one is this, fact one. The world that we live in is under a decree of death. It's under a decree of death. Now let me give you the context of the passage, especially chapter 6, beginning with verse 24. What has happened here is that Samaria, which at that time was the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel, was under siege by, uh, by the Syrian army. They had been troubled by Syrian raiders, but the king of Syria called those raiders back, verse 23 tells us that, but then he unleashed the entire army on the city. And so the army laid siege and they'd been there for months. And the situation had become desperate. You see, they were running out of food and no one could leave to find more supplies, and no one could enter to bring in supplies. So they really had become a city under a death sentence. For example, verses 28 and 29 in chapter 6, we see Samaria, a city under a death sentence. Then the king said to her, what is troubling you? And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today, and we'll eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. Do you see how the situation was so terrible that now the people have turned to cannibalism, willing to eat their own children? I submit to you, this is a picture of a city under a death sentence. But also, Samaria is a picture of the world in which we live. What does the Word of God say? The wages of sin is a nice education, earn all the money you can, get a big house or two, two or three cars, maybe even a vacation home, a nice retirement account, eat, drink, and be merry, and when you die, go off and enjoy eternity with your Santa Claus God. Is that what it says? <coughs> the wages of sin is what? The soul that sins, it shall die. That's what the Word of God says. Well, let me tell you, that can be applied both to the physical sense and the spiritual sense. For example, did you know today in the world in which we live, there are 800 million to 1 billion people that go to bed every night chronically hungry? Chronically hungry. 40 to 50,000 of those people die every day from hunger and hunger-related disease. Most of it hunger-related disease because they're malnourished condition, they cannot uh, fight against the, some of the diseases that we take for granted that can be healed and cured quickly. Now, let me have a little parenthesis here. Please, if this is part of your vocabulary, kick it out as far as you can. Don't ever say, 
I'm starving. Let me tell you, you're not starving. You may be hungry. You may want to, the preacher to hurry up and finish so you can get to the cafeteria. But you're not starving. There you what? These people are starving. And the majority of those who die, the 40 to 50,000, are children and senior adults. Now think of it this way. Every other day, a football stadium like Death Valley or williams Bryce is being filled with dead people and emptied every other day. That's what's going on in this world. Have you ever seen the real face of hunger? Well, my wife and I have. You see, I speak to you today from those 20 years of experience. In the last 10 years at the International Mission Board, I traveled to 68 countries. And I have seen, and most of those countries were not garden spots. I went in times of disaster, of national crisis, famines, things like that. And we have seen the face of hunger. It began actually while we were on the field in Venezuela. And we joined a little church in a slum area of Caracas. And we noticed that the children seemed to be underweight for their age, seemed to be listless, the babies and the toddlers. And we discovered that most of them had never had a bottle of milk. Those whose mothers could not breastfeed them, they never had a bottle of milk. So the bottles were being filled with water or they drained the juice off of the beans after they cooked them. And that's what they were feeding the kids. But praise God for Southern Baptist World Hunger Ministries, we were able to get funds to start a milk program to help them. I'll never forget going into the Niger Republic, Niger in Africa, and into the villages and see the little children run out with their big bellies and some of them their hair was red and, and at first you would think wow they're well fed and that's a unique trait for an African child that hair but no that's not what it was the bellies were swollen because of malnutrition their hair was turning red because of lack of proper nutrition in fact as I looked into many of them their eyes were glazed telling me that those kids were going to go blind because of a simple lack of vitamin A. Something, again, that we take for granted. I remember walking down the streets of Nicaragua, Brazil, and seeing a, a gang of children coming up, and they had something in their hand, and I looked, and it was plastic bags, and they had filled those plastic bags with some kind of solvent, lighter fluid, whatever they could, and they were sniffing it. Why? To cut their hunger pains. 10 to 20 million street children in Brazil alone. So don't say, I'm starving. You're not starving. I remember two occasions because Southern Baptists are people who care about those who are hungry, not only just spiritually. I was invited to go to North Korea, been to North Korea twice, to do a survey of their famine there. And I remember being in a a hotel room and looking out and see a city park and an elderly lady and a little child going through and they were pulling all the weeds and other vegetation they could and so I asked a Korean interpreter what are they doing they're pulling that so they can make some kind of soup to have something to eat don't ever say I'm starving you're not people in this world are literally starving but there's even a worse condition about 1.2 billion people have little or no access to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 85% of those people live in areas, uh, uh, excuse me, 85% of the most impoverished people in the world, those hungry that I've talked about, live in those areas of those 1.2 billion who have little access to the gospel. Did I not tell you something about the handiwork of the devil? He's a thief who's come but to kill and destroy. And he's doing that, he's killing people uh, taking their lives physically and keeping them away from the gospel. But not only do 1.2 billion have little or no access to the gospel, there are 2 to 3 billion more who have access to the gospel, but they've never heard the gospel. And some of them live right around you and me in this county and in this state and in the United States. They've heard the name of Jesus, but nobody's ever shared the gospel with them. And they're dying every... 125,000 lost people die every day to face a hopeless eternity. Now, some people object to that. 
Uh, wait a minute, are you saying that these people who've not heard the gospel and they're dying in their ignorance, that they're going to have a hopeless eternity separated from God in that place called hell with no hope at all? I was preaching in a big mega church down in Atlanta. And after the service, three couples, young couples, came up to me and said, listen, we need to ask you a question. You seem to be implying when you were preaching that those who die in ignorance, never heard the gospel, that they're going to be separated from God for all eternity in the place called hell. I said, oh, please forgive me. I didn't mean to imply that. I meant to make that crystal clear. They said, you've got to be kidding. God wouldn't do that. I said, okay, let's, let's analyze your logic and see how it differs from the Bible message. Do you know what you have done? You have just created a new gospel. It's the gospel of ignorance. And if what you say is true, then the gospel of ignorance is more powerful than the gospel of the cross. And if that be the case, why are we wasting our time having churches, sending out missionaries, having Christian institutions, if the, if the thing to do is just to keep people away from the gospel? And when they die in their ignorance, they're going to go straight to heaven. Second thing is this. If what you say is true, why would we want to serve a God so heartless and cruel that he would send heaven's best, his only son, to die on a Roman cross and a torturous death if it's all unnecessary? What kind of God is that? And I said, you see, I, I hear as a missionary, I hear that question all the time. What about those who've never heard? You're asking the wrong question. The answer to that was settled when Jesus Christ said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Every creature. We've not done that. So the question that you'll hear from God is not, what about those who never heard? But what about those of you who have heard, but you never shared? That's the question God's going to pose. How are you going to answer that? When so many are waiting to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, well, fact one is this old world is under a decree of death. But fact two is this, the world walks in the darkness of despair. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3 and 4. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall only die. You see what was going on here? These four lepers, they're at the city gate that's under a death sentence. If we stay here, we're going to die. And it, if, but if we go to the Syrians, they may kill us, but what's the difference? You see, living without hope leads to despair, and that's what was going on. These lepers we're between the proverbial rock and a hard place. What do we do? Well, when I was a student at Charleston Southern, back in those days, it was called Baptist College, I was a, a, physical a baseball player and a physical education major. And uh, in uh, one of our classes, they wanted us to go to what was called then the South Carolina School for the Mentally Handicapped. And they wanted us to develop a PE program. Most of the kids there were the precious Down syndrome children. If you've never worked with them, you ought to. What love they have to give. Well, everybody's favorite was a little boy named Freddie. And word went out to all of us teaching to drop what we were doing because Freddie was missing. And let's have a search party. We were given a whistle. And we were told as we walked across that massive campus, the first one to find Freddie, blow on the whistle and the rest will come. About 10 minutes into the search, I heard the whistle went to the sound, and on campus there, they were preparing a spot for a new swimming pool, and so they had this big hole in the ground. Little Freddie had wandered off, and he rolled down in that hole. And there he was, muddy and grimy, but he looked at us and had his trademark smile in place, and we were so happy to see that he was okay. One of the teachers about that time, she said, Freddie, what in the world are you doing in that hole? And that smile got bigger as he looked up, and he said, teacher, I'm just down here trying to get out. <laughs> well, that's these lepers. Uh, they were in a hole. They were just trying to get out. So a desperate act like going over to the enemy's camp didn't seem so foolish to them. 
You ever thought about why people do some of the crazy things they do? You see, living in despair leads to desperation. You ever thought about it? Why did the women in the story agree to murder their children and boil them in the pot? I'll tell you why. People living under a sentence of death without any hope will turn to anything to try to find deliverance. One of two million Venezuelans in the city of Caracas, where I served for so many years, give some kind of allegiance to the pagan fertility goddess, Maria Leonza. Some of them giving fruit and vegetable offerings, some floral offerings, some animal sacrifice, and on occasion, not often, but on occasion, a human sacrifice. Why? People living without hope are prone to turn to desperate acts to try to find some kind of relief. Why? Why in our own nation, and thank goodness the numbers are falling now, between 800,000 and a million babies aborted every year on the pagan altar of social convenience to the pagan god of elective abortion. Why? People who have no hope, without any hope, they turn in their despair and try anything. Carlos lived a life of desperation. I met Carlos. One of the ministries we had, even before we went overseas, I, I was a, a chaplain with Baseball Chapel, and chaplain in the Atlanta Braves organization, and now with the Greenville Drive, a chaplain for their Hispanic players. Venezuela's national sport is baseball. So when we got down there, we started baseball chapel with all their pro teams and many of the academies and the baseball schools. And I remember the first day I went into the academy that had been established by the New York Yankees looking for top players in Venezuela. And some guys came, the ball players came to the chapel service. And that day, 14 young men surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. Carlos was one of them. Carlos came on to uh, the United States, didn't play pro ball. But he went to Oklahoma Baptist University, graduated with honors. While he was there, two years, he was a summer missionary. One year, he went to New England, led some Boston Red Sox Christ. Another year, he was a summer missionary in China. And I get this. He was there in China, up on the Russian border, teaching English to Chinese and Russians. Now, God's got a sense of humor. A Venezuelan teaching English to Chinese and Russians. He then became a successful businessman. Uh, he made a lot of money. He was born and raised in poverty, though. You see, his life was not always so blessed. When he was two years old, his father deserted the family, leaving his mother to raise five or six children alone. They were very poor. She couldn't do it. So she asked a, a, an uncle of Carlos to take him in another part of Venezuela and care for him. Agreed to do that. But as he became, began to grow a little older, as a toddler still, the abuse started. They did things so bad to him, I can't even mention them from a pulpit. But one thing I can tell you, they would go off for three or four days at a time and they would leave him chained to the kitchen table and put pans of food and water out on the floor like he would for a dog or a cat. Then they'd come back and the beatings would start over. His mother found out what had happened. She rescued him from that situation, but the damage had been done. He had heart trouble, not physically, but hatred anger toward the father who deserted him and the mother who gave him up. But he began to look for meaning in life, and so he turned to his traditional Roman Catholic Catholicism and ritualistic practices, and he couldn't find it there. Uh, he turned to spiritism. He couldn't find it there. Uh, he became an actor in Venezuelan soap operas. Couldn't find it there. Uh, he... he uh, he, fi he finally decided, well, I've got a talent as a baseball player. I'm going to make a lot of money in the big leagues. And so that's when I, I met him. In fact, three days before I met him, he had been released from prison, sentenced to public drunkenness and street fighting. So he was in a desperate time in his life. But that first time he heard the gospel, he gave his heart to Jesus. And now he travels the world on business trips, sharing the gospel to government leaders and businessmen all over the world. Now only God could do that, but let me tell you something else. Two weeks after his conversion, I was back in the ballpark taking him through a discipleship study. He put his big old strong right arm around me. He's a home run hitter. And uh, 
he had the biggest smile, and he said, Bill, I got to tell you, for the first time in my life, I know what real joy is, and it's because of one person. And he said, Bill, it's not you. His name is Jesus. I love him with all my heart. But then he got quiet, and the grip tightened, and I heard him sobbing, tears just dripping on his face. And he said, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. He said, when did you first know about this gospel? I said, well, my mother took me to church when I was still in her womb. So, and every Sunday thereafter, after I was born, so I heard it early on. What, what, what about your father? Did he hear this gospel when he was a young man? Yes. What about his father? Yes. You think maybe even your grandfather's father heard? The, I said, yes. And he began to pound those bleachers, and he said, well, tell me this. Why did I have to wait until I was 18 years old to hear this gospel for the first time? Why didn't somebody come sooner and tell me? Why didn't somebody come and tell my father? Maybe my life would have been different. And I had to say to him, Carlos, don't be angry with God. He told us what to do. We just haven't done it. Praise God that Carlos, living in despair, found deliverance in Jesus Christ. Third fact, not only is this world under a decree of death, and not only does it walk in the darkness of despair, our God, and I, listen, let me back up and say this. If I stopped with those first two facts and we left, we'd probably be in despair. But that's not where the story ends. You see, the third fact is this. Our God delights in delivering a world that's under a decree of death and that walks in the darkness of despair. Verses 5 through 7, 2 Kings chapter 7. And they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites, the kings of the Egyptians, to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. Do you know what Samaria's only hope was? Samaria's only hope was a God-sent miracle. And just at the right time, not a second too early, not a second too late, God sent a miracle. He confused the Syrians with the sound of an army that was not even present. And it scared them to death, and they got out of Dodge as quick as they could. Now, if you never watched Gunsmoke, you don't know what Dodge is, so watch Gunsmoke. But they got out of town as fast as they could, leaving everything. Now, let me tell you, nothing's changed. The world's only hope is a God-sent miracle. And the on-time God for those four lepers in the city of Samaria has continued to be an on-time God. In fact, Galatians 4, 4, and 5 says, but when the fullness of time had come, what does that mean? Not one second too early, not one second too late, but at the precise, exact, appropriate moment in history, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that we who are under the law might be redeemed and giving the, given the full rights of sons. We have an on-time God. I don't know what you may be going through in your life, but don't you get up and think there's no hope because God's still on time. You trust Him. He'll always show up on time. Now, don't underestimate what it cost God to send His Son. It cost Him a lot to have that on-time appointment and the Son to take on flesh. Let me see if I can illustrate. Down in Venezuela, it's a beautiful country. We have the Andes Mountains. We have... Uh, the Amazon region, uh, we, we have Angel Falls, the world's highest waterfalls. We have a desert even, got camels in it too. But we also have a place, uh, it's called the Janos, the Plains country. And it's home to big herds of cattle. And every now and then the, the ranchers there have a, a challenge, they have a problem. You see, when a herd needs to be moved from one pasture land to another, if after it's been grazed out and they need to move it, many times they have to cross a river. And there are very few bridges there, so they have to ford the river. They have to find a place they can take the cattle through, and that's where the challenge comes. Because those rivers are homes to little eating machines about that long. I say they're about three-quarters teeth. You know what they are? Piranhas, yeah. Now, you see these movies where people stick their hand in the water and it just starts shaking? That doesn't happen. But 
piranhas are attracted to blood. And so you can see if a herd of cattle is going through and one of them scrapes its leg on a stone or gets cut somehow and blood's in the water, piranhas, comes in, they come in schools and sometimes hundreds, even thousands, and they can decimate a herd in no time. In fact, ranchers told us missionaries there that they have seen the piranhas clean a full-grown uh, bull to the bone in three to five minutes. That's a feeding frenzy. So what do they do? They select a cow, and they take that cow about a kilometer, half a mile or so, upstream the river, put her out in the water, and with machetes, they hit her several times. The blood flows downstream. Piranhas downstream, where the herd is found, are attracted upstream. And while they're feasting on that cow, the rest of the herd is taken to the other side. Now, they've got a name for that cow. Do you know what they call that cow? call that cow the substitute cow, one whose life is given so the others might be saved. Let me tell you, when that fullness of time came, God didn't stretch his hand out across heaven and select a substitute cow. He didn't even create a superman and say, I'm going to send a, a special type of person. If you'll just follow that example, you'll be okay. He didn't send a prophet to teach us new principles to live by. He didn't send an angel to impress us with miracles so we'd fall down in fear before him. What did he do? His hand rested on his only son, the pure spotless Lamb of God. He placed him in a river, but not a river filled with piranhas, but a river filled with my black sin, your black sin, the sin of the whole world, and there the lightning bolts of God's wrath that should come against my sin and your sin came against him, and Jesus paid it all so that we who trust in him will be taken safely to the other side as well as those that we lead to trust in him will be taken from the side of death to the side of life, and hallelujah. hallelujah. That's what he did. That's our Jesus. So it, did, it cost God to send his son. All right, one other thing, very quickly. We've seen three facts. This world is under a decree of death. This world walks in the darkness of despair, but we've got a God who delights in delivering people. It's not the will of the Father that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He delights in delivering people. But we can get all that down, and if we miss this last one and leave here without getting this one secure in our heart, and put it into action, it's all been in vain. This last one is this. Our God demands the dedication of his disciples. Of his disciples. You see, those delivered by God's miracle, as we see in this story, respond in one of two ways. The first way we see here that those delivered respond is with selfishness. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 8. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent, and, and they ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing. And what did they do? They went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. You know what they were doing? They got there, and they saw that God had worked a miracle. That enemy army was gone, and they thought, man, they started having a, a shouting fit. They're throwing their hands up. Praise God. Look how good God is. Look what he's done for us. Man, look at all of the food and the drink and the, and the gold and the silver and the fine clothes. Ain't God good? Over where I was raised, we said those old boys had a hallelujah hoot nanny. They just went wild. We never do that, do we? Let me tell you something, young folks. Don't be the kind of Christian that just shows up at chapel and you raise your hand and you sing along and then you get out into this world and you forget that there are people who still need Jesus. Well, that's what they did. But I don't know how it happened. I don't know if it was one leper or all four at the same time, but a spirit of repentance came upon them, and selfishness was turned into service. Uh, look, verse 9. Then they said to one another, We're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, now therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. You see it? Here's what happened. All of a sudden, they remembered. Wait a minute. God has worked a miracle. God has saved us. But there's a city over there called Samaria, and they don't know what God has done. They still think the enemy is in control. They still think there's no hope. 
They don't know. And here we are. We've got the message of hope. We can go and tell them what God has done. And so they ran with haste. And they told. You see, when those delivered by God's miracle respond as dedicated disciples, at least two things will happen. One, we'll share what we have. And that's exactly what they did. They, were, they decided we're not going to be stingy anymore. In the management of your resources, you say, well, I don't have many. Well, let me tell you something. Manage it well for God's glory, and he will continue to entrust you with more. But don't be selfish. There's a world out there that still needs to hear the gospel. Find ways through your local church, through mission agencies, to support the, the proclamation of the gospel by supporting financially those things. But also, not only do we share what we have, we tell what we know. We tell what we know. And that's what they did. But sadly, there are many followers that are not proclaiming the gospel to a perishing world. And what keeps so many followers from not declaring the gospel or from declaring the gospel to a perishing world? Well, I think sometimes it's fears that we have. Fear of danger. Man, man if, 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 if I say yes and God sends me to a place like this preacher's been talking about, some of those places, that can be dangerous. Well, you know the answer to that? So what? Is God not there? Yes, He's there. You know, that poor where we served in Caracas, two women were going to one of our churches on a Sunday night, and the thief jumped out. Two thieves jumped out from behind and stopped those two old ladies and said, Give us everything you have or we'll kill you right now. One old lady did what I probably would do. She started playing a tune with her kneecaps. She just got so nervous, just shaking. The other one, though, she lifted up a prayer to God. And then she looked at those. And she said, let me tell you something. All that we have is because of what God has given us. And all that we are is because of who Jesus is. Now in the name of Jesus Christ, leave us alone. Witnesses who saw this said those two things left a blue streak as they fled. The ladies went into church. When church was over, one of the thieves was outside the church. And he stopped one of the men as he left. And he said, listen, you know me and you know my partner. We have killed people for looking at us the wrong way, but something happened and how we can't explain. You see those two ladies? We tried to rob them, and that one said, in the name of Jesus, leave us alone. Now you tell me, when she said that, where did those four huge men with those flaming swords come from? Now nobody saw them but the thieves, because they're the only ones who needed to see them. So let me tell you something. Don't you fear serving God anywhere He calls or sends you, because the angels of the Lord encircle His servants. And unless God has a purpose for you to be harmed, you'll never be harmed as you're serving Him. Listen, I've been to places where I, I should be dead. But God, you can see God's kept me healthy. Real healthy. Maybe it's fear of lack of provision. If I say yes to God, can God really provide for me? Oh yes, He can. Let me take you back to Caracas again, 1989, my wife's birthday. Nationwide riots broke out. 5,000 people were killed in our city. We almost died. Uh, the government declared curf all 24-hour curfews. You couldn't leave. Uh, phone systems were down. They didn't have cell phones then. Everything was down. Thank goodness we had bought groceries and had enough for a month, but a lot of people didn't. And as the looters went from place to place, they would steal everything and then burn the stores down. We had been working, more so my wife and me, with a home for abandoned children on the other side of Caracas. We prayed for them. We couldn't call them. We couldn't go. Travel was prohibited. We didn't know if they had what they needed. But three weeks later, we were able to go back. We got there. The first question my wife asked the director's wife is, did you have food for the children? 36 children in that home. She said, no. Afternoon, the riot started, or the riot started at 12 noon. That afternoon was to be our shopping day, but all we had was a little bowl of flour that we make what Venezuelans call an arepa. And I had enough to make a serving of these little flour cakes for each of the chill, children. That was it for one day. Nobody, we began to pray, but nobody brought supplies. And so we went to bed, not knowing what the next day would hold. Got up and by habit, when I went through the kitchen, I lifted up the top of the flower bowl, and the flower was back in there. Nobody came that day, but the next day, I lifted up the top of the flower bowl, and the flower was back in there. 
And that went on for eight days as I prepared food for those kids using the flour for that day and the next day God had given it back to us. Finally, somebody came after eight days with supplies. Let me tell you something. Don't you ever fear obeying God because you think it's, you don't have the resources. The God of the Venezuelan flour bowl is your God. And He will supply those who are obedient to Him. Well, Carl F. H. Henry said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Young people, I beg you, there are many people in this world who are running out of time. And I know you have a career path and God doesn't want everybody to go to international missions. But there's going to be somebody here who's going to disobey God and not go to international missions. He's calling you. There are others you don't know if he's calling you or not because you've never asked him. So I want to ask you this morning as we close, would you at least say, Lord God, if you've got a place for me in some culture far away, some other land, some other people, I'm with it. I'm with it. Do you know what you always do? A lot of people say, God, show me your will. That's not the first prayer. The first prayer is, God, I want you to know I'm willing to obey your will. Then ask him to show me. So would you do that today? Would you say, Lord, I'm willing to obey. I'll show you the plan you have for my life. So I ask you to stand, if you would. And I'm going to pray for us. I want to give you a chance just to step out from where you are. If you're willing to say, Lord, if you have a place for me in international missions, I'm willing to obey. I'm willing to obey. Just step out in the aisle. Not much room down here, but you saw it even come down here. And I just want to pray that God will give you clear direction or time running out for many people. We don't go for the people. We go for the glory of God as He works in saving people. So right now, this is going to be the first. Just step out and come and say, God, I'm willing. I'm willing to obey it. You can step out and come to the front and you can fill the aisles. We'll come behind you. To do that, all right. I'm waiting. Who's the first? God, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go. Just come. Okay. There are others. He's coming. You know, I don't, I don't expect God to move. 100% of us in that way. He did mighty fine with Pueblo, didn't he? And he can do it, but wouldn't it be great if so many? Now, those of you who have come, I want to pray, but then I'll ask you to do this. I want to ask you to go to Jody or one of your other professors. I'll be around for a while. Go to someone and say, you know, I have prayed that prayer, God. I'm willing to obey. If you're calling me to international missions, I'm willing to go. I want you to go and tell that to a professor or, or to Joe, to Jody, or some of Dr. Krause, somebody. And just let them pray with you and, and stand beside you as, as you seek God's will for your life. And you can talk to me too. It's not far to Greer. Just give me a call. I'll come up here and come down there. So let's pray. Father in heaven, how wonderful you are. And Lord, thank you that you still send people to other people. God, I pray right now for these students, for these precious servants of Almighty God, that, Lord, that you would direct their paths. You tell us that our life is not our own, but it's the Lord who directs our steps. And so step by step, show your plan, your purpose for the life of each one of these young men and young women. Thank you, Father. And Lord, thank you most of all. One more time, we just want to thank you for doing for us what we could have never done for ourselves. When on Calvary's cross, through the blood of your son Jesus, you canceled the debt of sin that we ought to be paying. Thank you, Lord. We commit these students to you. Use them for your glory. In Jesus' name.